This is Spencer with the MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by Alfonso Gomez Rajon. You got it. All right. I was really, I was really trying to do it earlier yeah. this morning. Um, no, I get all the director all of uh, Me, Earl, and the Dying Girl, which uh, I'll, I'll state right now, I was thinking about this today, might be the most straightforward title. <laughs> like, if you're wondering what the movie's about, that title might give you some of the most yeah, yeah. <laughs> clear uh, information about it prior to seeing the movie. <laughs> um, but it's it's a very uh, sort of, I don't know what you want, sweet story about um, friendship and the challenges of things like death in a high school setting. Um, this was based on a book, a pretty well received book. Uh, what exactly brought you onto this project? Were you familiar with the book prior to the project or was this just a serendipitous sort of no, turn right, of No, the screenplay. There was a screenplay written. Um, Indian Paintbrush that financed the film mm. bought the book and hired uh, Jesse to adapt it. And, and so I received the uh, the script uh, and and so that and then after and then it took months to try to get the job and because uh, I really responded to the book and and Greg's journey in it and um, so after I got it and that's only only then did I go into the book back to the book and uh, and then Jesse and I started a dialogue and it didn't change that much we uh, I mean the size of it we had to it was a little we couldn't afford the ver the version of the script that I had read so it's about um, you know, tightening it up a little bit, and sometimes you'd go back to the book to find little gems mm. of scenes that got you out of jams. Sure, sure. And then, and then the, the end restructured a bit, and a few other ideas. But, but uh, so, so it was Jesse's uh, task to, uh, to adapt his novel. One of the interesting things, and this was, I think, very well done in the movie, but how difficult is it to work with a concept like cancer in a movie? It feels like that could be tremendously overwhelming. It could crush any potential humor that could be perceived. What is it like to try and balance that as like, this is not your only defining characteristic. This is not a cliche of who you are or something like that. What is that challenge like as a director? As a director, <clears throat> as a director, you have to tr trust in the text and, and the script uh, manage that so well and balance it so well. And that's very different to then translate it to visual, uh, visual language sure. and then and the scoring of it, it just that was the, the, the challenge of the, getting the tone right was something that you struggle with until the day you let it go. <laughs> um, and uh, but the, the real, um, it's a very, it's a look, it's a, it's a, it's a hard thing to, uh, it's a scary thing because you you know the worst version of that movie when you read it, oh, yeah. and you know the first the worst version of that movie that every day you go to the set, but you, you there's a lot of thought that goes into casting. And, and it was a very, very long casting process. And I mean, poor Thomas auditioned so many times. <laughs> and Olivia had to, once even after she got the role, she had to audition over and over again with chemistry, ke chemistry mm. reads with other Gregs. And I didn't care. I mean, it's one of those things like, we're going to do this thing together and we have to get it right. Yeah. And I have to be 100% sure that the comedy always feels fresh and light and effortless. And there's nothing worse than someone trying to sell a joke, as you know. And then... And that the drama was always going to feel grounded and never sentimental or over melodramatic or over the top, which it could go that direction. And I saw that happening all over and over again, you know, over the, the casting process. You meet so many actors. Um, and Olivia and Thomas just have this quality. Not only did they, their interpretations of Greg and Rachel feel very honest and very fresh, and they were funny in a very easy kind of way. They just, the words just felt like they were making them up as they were talking yeah. to you. And she had a, a, a grace about her and an elegance, and she grounded the movie. And you can see her be very much a 17-year-old and very much a woman and an adult and a coming of age, in her little coming of age that happens in the film very clearly in one particular scene. Um, and, uh, and Thomas had that wonderful quality. And then their chemistry together wasn't sexual. You could interpret that as sexual, and, and it could potentially be in the future, but there was something about the playfulness about them that they got their role, they were in, they, they got their characters so well that even when they interacted in, in, uh, on film and in their, uh, on the auditions, it was just the right kind of chemistry that didn't lead an audience to expect the traditional sure. love story. So that makes you feel good because now that's one thing that you that you that, that, that well that uh, I mean that's nice to be able to sort of not have that be one of the instant cliches when you come into this movie. It's like oh this is going to be yeah. a love story. And when I read the script, I like I appreciated that. I was never I didn't I never wanted to change that or cast it with like really beautiful people. And you're just gonna you're just gonna go there anyway, which is the inclination of a yeah, lot of Hollywood. I didn't want to do that. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to do that and had no interest. So. 
you've spoke about there, I mean, there is some levity to the regular story, but how much fun and how beneficial was it to be making those film parodies, which is definitely one of the most entertaining elements of the yeah, movie. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was torture trying to come up with a list of who to pay <laughs> sure, homage yeah, yeah. to. You know, there's, some, there's some good homages in the movie. Good homages. And, so, so, and that's one of the first things that Jesse and I talked about, because I think uh, Soccer Orange and uh, Aguirre Wrath of God um, uh, were scripted. And then some of the other ones tend to be a little more popular. And I was like, well, Jesse, you know, maybe we could... Nick Offerman is into Criterion. Let's just do some obscure movies. It's not going to make the mov- break the movie in any kind of way. No. You know, it's just a texture. Um, and, and so then, they, well, the, and then I started talking about the movies that inspired me and and, uh, and the mentors that I've had and the homages, all those. And then that, and it was absolutely. So once that, um, but coming up with that list was hard because who do you use, how do you turn down Buñuel but give something to Hitchcock? I mean, it doesn't make any sure, sense, yeah, you know? Yeah, so then yeah. there, were, there were like props. So then there were categories of directors and, and, and some were going to be uh, uh, homages, spoofs, you know, parodies in those films. Some were going to be props, DVD covers in the DVD store. Uh, some were going to be music cues, 400 Blows, <laughs> uh, Cat Stevens' Trouble from, you know, from, from uh, oh, uh, Harold and Maude. There's so many, and, and others were going to be posters, and others were going to be little things like Thelma Schoonmaker, of course, as he's a wonderful editor, is Greg's screensaver, and it was a picture from, from 1969. Uh, and she introduced me, of course, in Scorsese to Powell and Pressburger, so you have mm-hmm. all that. So they're everywhere uh and that and but then selecting what movies to spoof and then that the, those titles then jesse would re, would rewrite those titles and make them hysterical and then nate marsh and ed birch were two local uh, young filmmakers and also the we did all the animation in the film oh cool and they would go off and make these uh little film we'd select the shot we select uh-huh. the clip and they uh or they'd watch the film and 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 and, and offer what, what they can accomplish. And the rules were that they can only do things that two 17-year-olds could, sure. you know, what, what their costumes... Realistically achieve. Yeah, those yeah. costumes all come out of a Connie's closet or, you know, or, or, or Nick's closet. And, um, and then we, everybody worked together to get them off the ground. Early on in the production, certainly in pre-production, I was lucky enough to be part of it and very jealous um, because it was so much fun, and then then I get the big movie, and then but sometimes I'm up. They're down. They're upstairs doing Pooping Tom, and I'm downstairs doing something with Nick Offerman. It was a very uh, fun process, and then um, and then they but they were there, and they were incredible young filmmakers and and, and good friends, um, and I admire their talent so much. But uh, and they're incredible animators as well, and uh, they were. Uh, there were, it was it was the, the entire movie felt like you were making a student film. It was it was a, in, a very intimate process. That's very cool. Yeah, um, it was important to me to, to to keep it that way. You're somebody who's done a lot of work, sort of worked your way up the Hollywood food chain, if you will. Uh, I know you've done a lot of TV work and stuff like that as well. Um, what has sort of actually working your way to this point, sort of? influenced you when you finally were able to make this movie? Were there things you're like, oh, you know, I'm going to table that, bring that back around when I get, you know, that film, feature film chance or whatever? Were there things that you saw people do over the years that influenced you? What exactly was that, did that experience of sort of actually, you know, working your way up to this point versus just sort of being handed this film and being like, make a film? Well, look, it's easy to talk about it now because people like the movie. I don't know if people are going to show up and see the movie. I hope they do, but people were liking the movie, and it was my first personal film. I was able to do mm. some, say something personal with it, and leave something behind and make something for someone, and it feels good. Like the process of making it was, uh, Sarah. I messed up. I started. I, I, I was asking too many questions about himself. Can we get? It's nine minutes. It was my fault. It's, it's, it's my fault. Okay. Um, uh, um, so the, the process of making someone for something else, making a movie that, that expressed what I was feeling inside and leaving that behind, it felt great. And, and I, now I saw all these my heroes when they make, you can see their body of work reveals very much of who they, who they were at that time when they made that movie. And, and to feel, to get a glimpse of that um, felt great. Um, and I could, so it's easy to talk about it now, but it's been, you know, 
I decided I wanted to make films when I was 12 and I'm 42. That's 30 years. It's really high school and film school. And you think you're going to be having breakfast with Harvey Weinstein when you're 21. And it doesn't happen for like another 20 years. Hey, you know, maybe it'll happen tomorrow. Who knows? <laughs> I did. It did happen did you? after awesome. Sundance. But it was like I was, I was looking at, at Harvey and he's like, there's Harvey Weinstein. We're talking about movies. I seriously thought it was going to happen. You know, I used to intern in an office and see him in the elevator, things like that. But it, look, it's, it, sometimes it breaks your spirit. It's a very hard road. And I was climbing, I was going up the ladder slowly as a PA forever, um, and a, a personal assistant to directors that really changed my life, then second unit directing, and then television directing with an eye, and television directing is is, is an incredible career, but I really, I, I'm such a 20th century guy, I wanted to make movies, and, mm. and then finally be able to get a chance to make this movie, uh, now it feels great because... There's something to, you know, the Thelma Schoomer girl, we said it because we talk about that because sometimes things weren't going so well. But she said there's something really great because she's a late bloomer and I'm a late bloomer. And after Woodstock, she was in Pittsburgh making, uh, cutting documentaries about the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, so she knew Pittsburgh very well and she introduced me to a lot of her friends in, Pittsburgh's, in Pittsburgh. And so that always kept you going. And people like Thelma Schoomer, I mean, Thelma Schoomer and people like Nora Ephron, and Nick Pelleggi, all mm. these people that I'd, and I somehow scooped up over all my years working, all never stopped having faith in me. And uh, even when I had to move home for a little bit and and uh, and open a coffee shop or whatever, which did happen, Nora would still, still invite me to, to New York for Thanksgiving. That's and so they're always, and so they're very proud of that journey. But it's not always easy. But it makes you certainly appreciate it. And and because I was, I, I've been in production for so long and doing so many jobs from in a PA. Um, and on, or, or even you know anything, um, I it makes you appreciate every every job on the set, every every person on the set. I feel very comfortable on the set. I love being there. Even I love the highs and the lows, but I love the people. And um, and so I think in the long run, I think maybe it leads to longevity. But who knows? I mean, at the very least, being. Uh, considerate of everyone you work with is definitely love, yeah. gonna, that's definitely going to help you in the long term in Hollywood because you know burning those bridges is never a good thing uh, the real question though is did Harvey Weinstein buy you a bar uh, when you met with him and if not you buy should me a bar no, no why? what's he, the story he infamously bought the director of the Boondock Saints the bar he worked in oh. as part of the negotiation no I didn't get I got should, coffee should re renegotiate I got an omelet yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's 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 very exciting to see somebody who's so passionate about a project like this. Is this um, do you have aspirations to write, or do you is that one of those things that you care about? Because yeah. a lot of, there are a lot of directors who are very uh, specific that they want to direct material that they write, or is it just finding a project that you feel speaks to you? What is it sort of when you look at projects? I, I, I started as a writer and I got into AFI as a writer and I wrote quite a bit and I'm still writing. I enjoy writing with other writers and I certainly enjoy collaborating with writers like Jesse who are smarter and funnier and better writers than me and make the process fun and incredibly collaborative. Um, so, uh, but no, I, 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 there are projects that, I, that I've written that I wanted to direct and there are projects like me and Earl that speak to me and, and that I get in my own way and uh, that I will always pursue. I mean, you look at Scorsese's body of work, um, sometimes he, he writes the material and sometimes he doesn't, but he makes it his own. Yeah, and that's, that's I, if I could just have a body of work like him, you know, when I'm 90, it might be okay. After doing a film like this, what do you ideally try and follow this up with? Did you try and oh, do like something know. completely different, like a sci-fi film or you're something asking, dramatic? Or do, you, or do you like, because I mean, this is, this is a, a, a moving film, but there isn't a lot of heavy stuff that occurs with it. It seems like, you know, Maybe something lighter would be nice to change, or I I I, I feel like it'd be so tough to do dramatic film after dramatic film after. No, dramatic. I, you know, you're asking me this question when I'm at, at that point in my life. When Still I'm figuring gonna, it out. No, when I have to decide, yeah. when I'm going to decide, and everything changed since Sundance, and I'm reading a lot, and there's a lot of opportunities. But my only thing to, that I say to myself is that I, I don't want to make a mistake, um, and just go for anything uh, because. I just know that the high that I felt in making this movie by connecting to it personally, deeply personally, is something that I want to try to continue. Uh, it's a high I'll try to keep chasing, to try to find myself or a, pers or a hook or something that I'm thinking about or trying to work through, as I did with this movie, 
And I, I, you never want to go through the motions. I never want to be that guy. So I just want to try to find find something to it that speaks to me that keeps you, uh, gets you up every morning and wants, you know, I, I show up anyway, but <laughs> but you just want that emotional well, connection to it. Yeah, it was the sure. first time I felt, not a method director, but you, you just, you really felt it deeply because you were going through very similar sure. things and trying to process emotions and trying to make something out of that. And so, um, so uh, something to that effect, I just have to feel it and connect to it on a personal level, no matter what the, uh, the genre is. Okay, so the film is Me, Earl, and the Dying Girl, um, releasing when? June 12th. June 12th, a website for it? I think it's meandearlmovie.com, but I should, we should, do you know that? Well, uh, I'll put it. Meanearlmovie.com, okay. I think that's what it is. People can Google it, worst case scenario. Yeah. It's pretty easy to find this <laughs> stuff now. And in terms of you personally, is there anything else you want people to keep their eyes out for that you've worked on? Or do you have a Twitter or anything that I people don't have keep? anything. I'm, I'm very 19th century. I don't way. blame you. I don't blame you. Stay out of the eye. Um, well, thank you so much for doing this. I wish you the best of luck with thank the film you. and seeing what's next. Thank you so much. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. It's tight, don't even try to bite the side of the side. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.